We're continuing our investigation into the financial crisis, this time with municipal finances from somebody who you're really going to want to know. His name is Harry Gatchins, otherwise known as Citizen Harry in, in My Edmonds News. Harry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stan. I'd like to be here. I was just thrilled when I saw the column that you wrote in My Edmonds News and uh, about municipal finances. I learned so much about it. We're going to be going through that in detail, but... My Edmonds News and Citizen Harry, tell us just a little bit about what that is. Well, uh, I've uh, been involved for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, a citizen of Edmonds and following what's going on in Edmonds. And I used to watch the Edmonds City Council meetings on TV on my boring evenings. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day I finally decided to go down and actually see one in person. And it was a totally different experience than watching on television. Uh, and I met the woman who was in charge of My Edmonds News there. And I had written, uh, for my own purposes, uh, a recap of what it was like to try to get appointed to the city council. And she suggested it might be good for her readers to get that same experience. And then from that, I just started writing articles about what I thought was going on in the city's finances. Uh, and you're an accountant by trade, right? Yeah, I, I've spent 35 years as financial management for a number of firms. Um, and uh, so, my main interest is in what was going on in the city on a financial basis. Uh, I'm not as well versed in uh, environmental issues or those sorts of issues, but from a financial perspective, I could see what they were doing, and a lot of what they were doing didn't make sense. So I started writing articles, trying not to be too critical, but trying to put it in a format that the average citizen could understand what it was they were talking about when they are having these mm -hmm. discussions. We actually have the column that we're talking about. We have it up on the screen, and we will be getting it up on the screen throughout the show. Um, because I wanted to make sure, though you're writing about Edmonds, it seems like from what I saw, it could be applicable to just about any municipality. Well, I think what's going on is not only municipalities, it also works on the state and the federal level. Everybody is having financial crises at this point. And you know, the citizens don't want to lose their services. They don't want to pay more taxes. Uh, the city says they need more revenue. Well, the only revenue they have is taxes, so it becomes an issue on how do we either raise more revenue or at some point we're going to need to cut the services we provide the citizens. And those are going to be tough decisions at all cities. The state's cutting a lot of things. City of Seattle spent cut a lot of things. And the federal government's going to have to start cutting things sooner or later. The difference between the federal government and a, and a municipality is the municipality is required by law to have a balanced budget every year. So they can't go farther and farther into debt. Um, and so they're, they're going to face the issues quicker than the federal government's going to face them seems like uh, that uh, that you and a lot of people in small cities, and Edmonds is a small city, that they care about their city quite a lot. Ed Edmonds is a city, it's a pretty stable population. A lot of the people have been there many, many, many years. Uh, it's, they try to keep a small town uh, atmosphere. And yeah, there are, it's probably more engaged than a lot of cities. I think we had over 65 percent in the last election for city count, not a you know presidential election, but a midterm election, uh, which is a pretty high percentage for a state in Washington, a city in the state of Washington. There was um, in preparation for the show, because let's just get right into it, because we're going we're going to talk about municipal finances. There, well, government finances is pretty tough right now. You said that all you have to do is just look at one very simple Edmonds economic projections, where you've got, and we've got it up on the screen, where you've got expenses going up and revenue coming down. Well, the city of Edmonds does a five-year projection of what they expect their expenses to be. And like I said, by law, they're required to have a balanced budget every year. And so the last 10 years, they've always had somewhat of a balanced budget. But they show projections for what they expect to happen in expenses over the next five years. And those go up an average of 3 3 3.5% a year. Uh, their revenues, their primarily revenues are from property taxes, which is a, because of the Tim Iman initiative, there's a state cap of it could only go up 1% a year. Uh, and then they also get their, their second highest source of revenue comes from city sales tax. Well, as you, everybody knows, the uh, economy is in a bit of a, a downturn, and the city of Edmonds doesn't have a big retail base anyway. So uh, their projected revenues only increase by 1% a year. Their ex projected expenses uh, increase by three and a half percent a year. Now, I don't care where you start. If you continue those two different slopes, sooner or later you start running out of money. And for the city of Edmonds, it happens in 2014, 
14 with them actually facing bankruptcy in 2017 if they don't grab a hold of those two lines and change them. Wow. Well, let's go right to the column. I'm reading from the column, as the city of Edmonds looks forward in its financial uh, forecast, it sees nothing but red ink projected. What can be done to stem this trend and make sure that our city continues to be livable without taxing citizens into poverty? My question when I read that is, is this the new normal for governmental entities, particularly cities that have mandates pushed down upon them? I think, I think it is at the moment, yeah. Um, as I said, all sorts of cities are facing this. Uh, there are certain cities that have a different tax base facing than Edmonds do that aren't facing it quite as drastically. Uh, and then there are cities, I think we did a step, look at one back in New York, where I mean, their whole industrial base is falling to pieces, and so they're facing it worse than the city of Edmonds. Uh, you know, and at some point, as I said, the city of Edmonds is a bunch of people who live there a long time. They like their city, uh, and they like their services. And you also ask them, and they don't want to pay any more taxes. And, and you can't have it both ways. So that is going to be a problem. Uh, and I think ultimately what will happen is people will end up having to, cities will have to start cutting services. So it sounds like you're talking about that uh, cities, Edmonds being one of them, uh, is going to have some kind of, of really drastic change, revolutionary change almost in the way that it approaches whether government services or taxation, or uh, both. It is going to happen. Um, and it's really sort of inevitable. Uh, unless... Given that inevita inevitability, how, how can the people, you know, get together to be able to agree upon something, or is that not going to happen? I think they can, uh, and I'm somewhat, I have a different approach to it than I think, uh, I seem to see the politicians have. I, I think the citizens like Edmonds, and I'm sure in whatever other city are, they like their city. Uh, they don't want to pay more taxes, but they, what they particularly don't want to do is they don't want to pay more taxes when they think the, the government is misspending the money they're already getting. And the city council in Edmonds and in other cities say, well, you know, people don't want to pay more taxes, but if we make it a tax for parks, they like parks, so they'll pay that money. Uh, but what happens is that becomes kind of a shell game to the citizens, and they see what you're doing. You're, you're just asking for more money, but you know you're not gonna, they aren't going to vote for more money for general government. So they say, well, let's, let's charge money for taxes, and people vote for that. Uh, I think the citizens care enough about their city that if you just laid it out and really talked about it, clearly and precisely that this is how much money it costs to run our city. If you like the way our city runs, we need more money and this is how much more money you're going to have to come up with. But there is also going to be a point where unless they can figure out some way to take control of the expenses, there isn't going to be any more ability to tax those citizens. Uh, the city of Edmonds proposed a, a property tax levy of a million dollars a year. Uh, and the problem with that was, number one, it got defeated handily uh, because it was again split up into various things and it looked like a shell game. Uh, but also, the million dollars a year would cover the city for three years. At the end of the three, but at the end of the three years, then not only would you need to renew that levy, but now because you've continued to let the expenses grow at a faster rate than the than the taxes have, you're going to have to add another million dollars. Well, now you're asking $2 million, you know, and sooner or later, people just can't, can't afford to pay more taxes. Well, oftentimes the public is criticized as being short-term thinkers, but it sounds like in that instance that the public was a long-term thinker, and perhaps those who proposed the levy were thinking a little bit shorter term. Well, I'm afraid they were both short-term thinkers at that point, because nobody really addressed what the long-term issue was. Uh, I've been speaking to the city council for the last couple of years that you just cannot continue to make projections that show your expenses growing at a faster rate than your revenues. Uh, and it's foolish to make that projection and try to scare people and think, well, they're going to need to come up with more money. It just can't happen. Let's go back to the, the column. The bulk of the city's revenue comes from two tax sources, property tax and sales tax. With the economic downturn and the lack of major retail centers in the city, sales tax are, uh, taxes are growing at a very small level. So I, I come back to my question for, of before. Isn't this the new normal for cities, too? Yes. Uh, it, it is. I mean, all sources of revenue for cities are going to de decrease 
either decrease or not increase very rapidly. Uh, and certainly they're not going to increase at the speed at which the expenses are. So the cities and state and federal government need to figure out a way to reduce the increase in expenses. Mm -hmm. Throughout the United States, and particularly in smaller cities, the demographic, the population is aging at a greater rate than, than in larger cities. Uh, that being the case, I mean, as people age, they don't buy more things because they've already got this stuff. So then that means that sales tax revenues are likely to not, to, to be hit yet again. Um, and that's regardless of the economy. So if, even if the economy does recover, you've not got a population that spends. Correct. And facing all of this, you're in government. I mean, what do you do? Well, I think what you really need to do is you need to look at the services you're providing, and you're just going to have to at some point say, we can't do this anymore. Now, uh, but when you say services, I hear police and fire. And well, there's police, there's fire, there's... Um, you know, the building department, there's, uh, in the city of Edmonds, they have a, well, there's parks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's beautification programs. There's fixing the streets. You know, unfortunately, none of those things. I want all of that. Yeah. But yeah. I, I really don't want you to raise my taxes. And that's where the citizens also have to try to pick up the ball and say, what can we do? You know, and the cities can try to figure out ways to be more efficient in the way they provide those services. Uh, and I think they try hard, but they, but they, you know, they're based on this is the way we've always done it and what minor change can we make. They may need to start all over from scratch and say, okay, this is all the money we have and these are the things we have to do and how can we allocate the money and then what's the cheapest way we can do these mm -hmm. things. And it may not be the way they did it in the past. That's really hard though because, I mean, that's a true shock to the system, but the shock has already happened though, hasn't it? Well, it's a shock to the system, and many cities are still fighting it. Uh, but again, they're all facing the point where sooner or later we're not going to have any money, and it's better to plan for it than to all of a sudden get to 2016 and say, well, we're bankrupt, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. How did, how did it get this way? Is it all based on the, the economy, or is it, uh, do you have to throw in the aging population, uh, changes in demographics? What do you, how did it get this way? It's partly based on the economy. The economy has certainly made it more a, a bigger impact. Uh, you know, and, and what you have in, the, in our in city of Edmonds budget is that uh, they've cut all the things they can cut outside of personnel costs. Uh, and there's a lot of union people in the city, uh, and there's union contracts that get negotiated. Uh, Health care costs are going up. Uh, and you can't really blame the unions, uh, and particularly in the city of Edmonds, the, the union I mean, needs to fight for its employees as much as it can. And, and even if they see that the city of Edmonds has these needs, and okay, well, what could we do to help out the city of Edmonds, that same union represents people throughout the, throughout the country. And if they make a concession for the city of Edmonds, then Boston and Los Angeles and Seattle and everybody's going to ask for those same concessions. So they fight as hard as they can. And if they're going to make a concession, it's not going to be for a small city first. It's going to be for a bigger city where they have to. Mm -hmm. And that's where you had the problem in Minnesota with the, with the teachers. Um, and again, there's no really perfect answer for it because the city can't afford to pay what they were paying. Or the state couldn't afford to pay the money they were paying but you don't really want to penalize the teachers either because that's a very important service. So what do you do? And they ended up getting in a huge fight with the union. And hmm. We're going to take a very short break. We're very fortunate to have Harry Gatchins with us as we continue on in our investigation uh, into the financial crisis around the United States. What we're talking about is how it hits, hits home. And Harry Gatchins is a, an accounting and financial management professional who writes a column called Citizen Harry in my Edmonds News, uh, where he lives in Edmonds, Washington. And um, we're going to put the website up on the screen. Strongly encourage you to, to go to that, uh, that website, read the column. Perhaps it's applicable to your city. More than likely, it probably is. I also want to put this up on the screen. The Edmonds economic projections, the percentage increase. You've talked about how the city of Edmonds is looking at the possibility, if it doesn't change, of bankruptcy in 2016, 2017. If they, if they don't make changes from the projections, that's what the numbers show. Uh, obviously, 
because they're required to have a balanced budget, that isn't going to happen. And because that isn't happen, that's why I'm trying to get them to change the way they show their projections, because let's show something that, that makes some sense. So is this just an accounting thing? It's not an accounting thing. Thing, but it, I, I, what they're trying to do is attempt to get the citizens to see that somewhere down the road this is going to happen. Uh, but I just think, it, you know, they've been showing this same projection for five years now, and it's always just moved out another year. So sooner or later, the citizens just look and say, "Well, that's what you told us five years ago. It didn't happen. So why do I think it's going to happen this time?" So they're just basically, the powers that be just aren't dealing with it. I think so. Yeah, I, th I think they need to be. Rather than just say we need to increase revenues, I think they need to talk seriously about at some point they're not, they, not, they haven't ever increased revenues over the last five years, though they keep saying they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have to admit we're not going to be able to do that. So let's start talking about what things we can do to cut the expenses. Is it just too hard? Is, is government uh, in a small city or, or a large city, is it just too hard now? It's certainly very hard, but it can be done if uh, you know if you aren't worried about your own particular re-election you're willing to be absolutely upfront to the citizens say this is where we stand and this is what's going to happen but nobody wants to give that bad news hmm. um, the city of Edmonds interesting it's got the beautiful coast and there's some beautiful parts to it and then there's highway 99 and you know to a lot of people highway 99 isn't all that attractive but right. isn't it a pretty significant retail core it can be. Right now, a lot of Highway 99 through Edmonds is old, dilapidated properties. And so uh, the city is going through a strategic plan to develop better economic growth. Because if you get economic growth, that helps the tax base, mm -hmm. which will then help resol resolve this. Uh, and, you know, a lot of, really, the, city of Ed the Highway 99, and I don't think by the city staff, but by a lot of citizens of Edmonds, is considered totally separate from the rest of Edmonds. And I think the people who operate, operate businesses on that Highway 99 feel that, and they think, you know, whenever you talk about Edmonds issues, you're always talking about what's down in the downtown bull, and you don't care about us. And then I also don't think people are doing enough to help either help get that developed and, and say, you know, what can we do to make it more attractive for thriving businesses to take these spaces on Highway 99 rather than, you know, a pawn shop or a... Uh, an old, out-of-business tire store. Well, what do you think? What can be done? Well, I think they need to focus on working with the business community that's already there. There's a lot of auto dealerships. There's become a new Asian market center. Uh, and they're very thriving. But if you go in between them or down south of them, and there isn't much. And I think you need to work with those two business sectors and say, what, can we, what would we do that would make it more attractive for more businesses like yours to come here? You know, interesting, uh, I'm sure that, that people who live in Edmonds may think that, this, that their city is the only one that's like that, but actually there are, there are other cities like that just here inside our, our viewing area. In, in, uh, in King County, as a matter of fact, there are small cities that are just like that. I used to live in one, Des Moines. It sounds exactly like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and in other cities I've been in the United States, the same issues seem to be happening. Um, so when you talk about the finances of the city of Edmonds, you could very well be talking about the finances of the city of fill in the blank. Correct. Absolutely. Let's go back to the column. The only way property taxes can go higher or lower than uh, that is either by uh, a reduction in the rate approved by city council, which is highly unlikely, or a voter approved increase such as the levy uh, rejected last November. So my, with property values, they're not going up. Yeah, but uh, property values don't really have as, as much effect on property tax as people think they do. Um, the property tax as a whole for the city of Edmonds can go up 1% a year. And it can go up no more than 1%. Uh, it, again, it could go on less than 1% if the city council chose to do that. But trust me, with the <laughs> economic system, that's not going to happen. But but what happens is, and let's, for the city of Edmonds, the property taxes are fourteen million dollars. Okay, and if the price of all, if the price of the land goes up thirty percent, the the property tax still can only go up by that one percent. They just mm. take the fourteen million dollars and now they spread it equally over the increased value of the property. Same thing if the value of property goes down. I mean, 
my particular house has gone down in value by over a third, yet the property taxes still continue to go up 1% a year. And I suspect that the, the public, uh, especially the, the public who has lived in the same house for a long time, is not real happy about that. They're not happy about it. And, no. they, and they, they say, okay, my house value went down. I got my, not I got my notice from the county saying my house is only worth a third of it's worth before. But my property taxes go up. What is it? And, and how can I afford that? You know, and a lot of people in the city are on fixed incomes or limited income. And certainly, uh, you know, the economy isn't making huge raises for people. So for property taxes to even go up by that 1% a year still causes a real issue for people. Something else that, that really seems to be changing, and it's uh, largely due to technology, is that office buildings, those types of, of properties, and, and I know you probably don't have a whole lot of, of very tall office buildings in Edmonds, but, but office buildings and other commercial structures aren't nearly as valuable as they used to be because so many employees are now working out of their house. It's, it's certainly not spurring new development in Edmonds or in, in other cities. Mm -hmm. uh, and business, the city of Edmonds doesn't have a, a business tax. There's no tax on the business. And so the fact that people are now running businesses out of their home uh, not only doesn't bring new businesses, buildings into the city, but there's no tax for the city to collect on the people who run the businesses out of their home. Uh, because it, this, you know, other cities at least have a business, li a bus there's a business license, but there's no business occupation tax like there are in other parts of the other cities. So this is an awful lot for, uh, for someone inside government to face, though. Um, and let's, let's say that you're not an em employee, but you're an elected official. And you're in, a, in, in small cities, you're part-time. You're not a, you're a full-time, and there's not a, a requirement that you have a PhD in economics. How can we be equipped, we, the general public, be equipped to deal with this? Well, that's why I got involved in writing the stuff for my Edmonds News, um, because for the bulk of the citizens, uh, you know, it just this doesn't make sense. I don't know what they're talking about, and even for the bulk of the city council, I mean, city council you need people with, with multiple skills, and not everybody on the city council is going to have any kind of an economics degree or even a really good understanding. Uh, and so the city councils need to have at least somebody, and, and a good finance director for the city, who can explain what's going on. And that's what I try to do with the column in my Advance News, is I try to take what's there and put it into words that a citizen who isn't an accounting major could understand what the real issues were. And that was the whole point of the article, was to say, okay, these are what the real issues are. You know, I don't have the answers. I threw out some suggestions, you know, maybe you, need, maybe you want to think about putting in casinos or, or maybe you want to allow taller buildings. I'm not saying any of those things are the right things to do, but if you don't want to pay more taxes, these are some options that the city needs to think about and you should let your city representatives know what your thoughts are. Let's go back to the column. Say, obviously the city wants to pay fair and equitable wages and provide quality insurance benefits to its employees. And to date, the unions have not been willing to make huge concessions in these areas. Some other organizations are negotiating concessions from uh, unions, but it is a very difficult task. And so my question is, is, is the union issue aside, is it really time for all cities to look at exactly what they do and maybe go back to the very beginning? I think we kind of touched on this earlier. Um, I mean... Provide just, less, less services, you know what I'm saying? Well, where, where cities, you know, where you start with the basics, you know, you got to have police and fire and transportation, I suspect. What else, what else do the citizens have to have? Do they have to have economic development? Do they have to have uh, some type of charitable participation? What is, citizen, is, is that where cities are going to go, where they have to go back to the very basic, and then all the contracts with all the unions have to be renegotiated? Well, they're going to have to. I'm not sure about the part renegotiating all the contracts, but they definitely have to go back because there, there's a, a requirement in the state constitution that cities cover fire, you know, police, roads, infrastructure, you know, anything beyond, those are absolute must-haves. The city has to provide those things. Then there's parks or libraries or arts. Those are things that are more optional. You know, and, but if you, wanna, if you wanna have a livable city, you wanna have those things. Uh, some cities have, well, the city of Edmonds has sold off their fire department uh, and now they're paying for that service. Uh, at, at the time, it, it made economic sense. 
when the contract comes up for renegotiation, since they don't own the fire department anymore, they don't have a whole lot of negotiating mm -hmm. uh, power for a new price. One of the ways that the city of Edmonds tried to do it, but it got rejected, and uh, is through levies. The city of Seattle is um, is where I live, and there's just a ton of levies that are coming up. And actually, there's an article from the Seattle Times just from uh, just from a few days ago. Um, well, when we when we uh, do the show. There are the library levy of 123. This is all this year. Library levy 123 million. Seawall waterfront 250 million. Fire facilities at that one expires, so that's up for renewal. The juvenile justice center 200 million. Um, automated fingerprint information, which is up for renewal. That is just this year. And I'll tell you, as a citizen, I elect the people inside inside every government to do the job. Mm -hmm. And don't come back to me with all of these levies. You do the job. You set the priorities. Well, and that's where I think you and I probably agree. I think the, the people you elect need to come and, sit, and rather than do it piecemeal, as you're pointing out right there, uh, say this is what the amount of money it takes to run our city, and this is the amount of money we need to ask you to give us. And if you do it in a convincing manner and you don't, you don't spend money foolishly, which is the first thing people will point out is, well, you spent money foolishly on this or you spent money foolishly on that. Uh, so you really have to think about the money. You know you're going to run out of money, so you got to think about the money you spend and don't do it on things that are sort of more of a whim. Thank you very much for writing this fantastic uh, column because I learned so much from it, and unfortunately we only have like about a minute and a half left, but i got to get to this, this one thing. With the change of businesses today, something that it seems like is absolutely necessary is good bandwidth. Is that a, a way to go for a potentially additional tax revenues or traction of business if Edmonds were to become the most wired city in, in western Washington? Well, Edmonds happens to have the benefit of having some high-speed fiber excess capacity. Uh, they're not allowed to be in the business of just reselling fiber, but, but they are able to sell their excess capacity. And that's a way they could both generate some new revenue also attract new businesses, um, and that's something I think they should look at very closely. For someone who's watching this show, whether they live in Edmonds or not, what should they do? I think they should pay attention to what's going on in the budget. One of the things that cities are doing to postpone this inevitable problem is they're stopping doing, paying for maintenance and stopping for, on roads, on buildings, on streets. Those things are part of that general group of things we said they're supposed to pay for. Well, because it doesn't show until 10 years later that you didn't do maintenance on a building, uh, it's a way for them to hide the, from the reality. And I think mm -hmm. people need to make sure that all of those things get covered and they need to pay attention to what's going on in their city. Well, we've come to the end. And maybe the thing that, that we should do in all cities is to clone Harry. Every city, every city should have a citizen Harry, somebody who is helping us learn about our own municipal finances. We'll see you next week. Take care.